Welcome everybody. Good evening. I'm gonna give people a minute or two to get uh, let in from the waiting room and get settled. While that's happening, maybe we can put our our first poll question up for people to answer while they're waiting for us to get started. Just like to ask folks who are joining a little bit about where you're coming from. <clears throat> Go ahead and take a minute to uh, mark your response to whether you live, work, or recreate in the Chehalis Basin while we give people another minute or two to, to get all set up and joined. Seeing lots of names I recognize and lots of names I don't, so that's great. Glad to see a number of people joining us tonight. We'll start in one more minute. So if you haven't answered the poll question that's on your screen, I urge you to do that. All right. Well, I think we're probably uh, at about the uh, about the time we should go ahead and kick it off. So welcome, everybody. I'm Andrea McNamara Doyle with the Office of Chehalis Basin. Um, I am going to uh, actually have a test from uh, Ross um, Strategic give us a quick um, overview of how to participate in the webinar this evening. Go ahead, Tess. Hi everyone. Um, if you are having any difficulties um, getting in and out of the webinar, I'm the one um, that you should reach out to. We've got our email um, up there that you can email me or, and I'll put it in the chat as well. Um, this is useful because you may have noticed that um, you have come in muted. We're gonna be taking um, Q&A via the Q&A box, um, but right as we're getting started, uh, we've got closed captioning on, so that's that little CC down at the bottom of the screen, so um, that can be um, a little bit helpful if you're having trouble, um, you know, understanding anybody or audio is not coming quite through, but hopefully that should be all clear, and we also are offering Spanish interpretation tonight. So there's a little globe symbol down at the bottom of your dashboard that'll allow you to um, listen to Spanish interpretation. So we'll have a presentation, but at the end of that, um, there'll be an opportunity for question and answer. Um, and on the next slide, you can see um, where that Q&A button is down at the bottom. And you'll see that when you click that button, there's a little dialogue box that will pop right up. So you can submit questions anonymously. Um, we will um, do our best to answer some of them live. Some of them will be responded to um, via text just in that dialogue box correctly. And if you've phoned in tonight, um, just using the the phone number on the Zoom confirmation. You might not see that Q&A box, um, but we can take your questions at the end using uh, star nine um, is the way to kind of raise your hand to indicate that you have a question. So we'll make sure to prompt again for that. You don't need to remember star nine, um, but uh, we'll do our best to call your phone number, um, the last four digits, and uh, make sure we get you unmuted. Thanks, Andrew. Thanks, Tess. Um, 
All right, so we've got a great group of presenters tonight who are excited to talk with you um, and answer your questions about the local actions, non-DAM uh, alternative work that is underway. Uh, I'd like to start by introducing the co-chairs of the land steering group that have been guiding this effort. Uh, Todd Chaffet has lived in the basin for more than 25 years and has held a variety of roles in the community including positions like chairing the Twin Cities Rotary, the United Way of Lewis County, the Chamber of Commerce, and the Lewis County Public Facilities District. It was uh, his involvement with the United Way during and after the 2007 floods that have had a huge impact on Todd and brought to the forefront um, for him the importance of finding a flooding solution in our basin. Todd's currently the Infrastructure Initiatives Program Manager at the Economic Alliance of Lewis County, where he's developing an interactive GIS mapping tool that's capable of showing and tracking all planned new developments throughout the, the county on a single map in order to enable better coordination between local, county, and state agencies, as well as private organizations. So welcome, Todd. Um, Glenn Connolly is uh, our other co-chair. He is the director of the Chehalis Tribes Natural Resources Department, and he's worked for the tribe since 2004. Glenn has a BA in environmental science studies and has worked in the construction and public health fields before getting into natural resources protection. He's been directly involved in floodplain management and restoration for more than 16 years and has a deep appreciation for natural river ecosystems. After Todd and Glenn tonight, you're gonna to hear from Alex Dupi, a principal with MIG, which is the consultant team that's been working with the land steering group in developing potential solutions for long-term flood damage reduction. Alex has over 20 years experience as a planner working with public and private clients across the country on complex urban planning, community design and development and transportation projects. He brings a lot of facilitation experience to help uh, engage clients and stakeholders and the public at large in complex and sometimes contentious conversations um, to help define shared goals and build consensus around implementation strategies. We've got Dave Rogers on our call tonight. Uh, he's an engineer who's practiced for 30 years across many different areas of civil engineering. His experience uh, ranges from regional transportation projects to infrastructure renovation projects in urban areas to site development for park settings and environmental cleanup projects. So this breadth of experience has allowed Dave to bring creative solutions uh, to the benefit of multiple stakeholders like those we're working with in the Chehalis. Uh, as for me, again, I'm Andrea McNamara-Doyle, the director of the Office of Chehalis Basin. I've been in this position for about five years, supporting the Chehalis Basin Board and guiding the development and the implementation of what we refer to as the Chehalis Basin Strategy. Most of my career has been spent uh, at the intersection of legislative policy work, legal review, and executive level program administration in the environmental and natural resources field. Um, so that's who you're going to hear from tonight. Uh, quickly, just to cover a little bit of what we're going to do, uh, we're going to start with a short overview of how tonight's uh, land presentation relates to the broader Chehalis Basin strategy. You're going to hear uh, then uh, from our co-chairs, Todd and Glenn, and then we're going to turn it over to Alex to give the main presentation about the potential programs and interventions that are a part, uh, emerging as part of the local actions non-down alternative uh, with Dave as uh, available as needed for technical questions. Uh, and then we're gonna have um, q and A Q &A, as Tess mentioned at the very beginning. So um, without further ado, I think we should jump right into the content we have for you tonight. Um, the Office of Chehalis Basin was created by the legislature to aggressively pursue a science-based and community-driven long-term strategy for addressing two of what we refer to as the Chehalis Basin's most pressing challenges. I know there are others, but for us, it's repeated catastrophic flooding and the continued devastating decline of salmon fisheries and other species that depend on our river systems. 
The offices work on the strategies led by a diverse group of Chehalis Basin board members who are all bound together by their shared commitment to the long-term resiliency and vitality of this basin and its associated region. The strategy is already funding projects and programs at all scales, small, medium, and large, in order to make progress on our goals. What we do as part of the strategy is we help individuals and communities protect homes and businesses from flood damage. We work with landowners to slow harmful riverbank erosion and restore habitat for salmon and other aquatic life. And we help prepare our region and its future generations for more frequent major and catastrophic flooding that we know is coming. And that's what we're gonna focus on tonight. So how the Chehalis Basin strategy works we believe we don't have to choose between keeping people safe and protecting aquatic life. In fact, we've got the science and solutions to do both of those things better by addressing them at the same time. That's why this strategy uses an integrative approach whenever possible. So the strategy is a collaborative effort of community leaders, local, state, tribal government officials, local residents, scientists, business owners, nonprofit organizations, and others who are also jointly committed to making the Chehalis Basin a safe, healthy, and abundant place to live. Our Chehalis Basin board members have accepted a pretty heavy responsibility of taking on these extremely complicated, politically charged problems together using a truly collaborative approach. Problems that have each been decades in the making and that are only getting worse with each passing season. Their collaboration is based on voluntary cooperation, not regulation, not litigation, but the power of respectful relationships and community partnerships. And while they certainly don't agree on everything, I can assure you one thing that they are in absolute agreement on is that this basin is not going to succeed in fully tackling either side of the equation without addressing both the fish and flood challenges plaguing our floodplains. So while they continue to wrestle with some of these long range plans, the strategy is also putting solutions into action now to protect people as well as fish and wildlife. This next slide shows how the Chehalis Basin strategy has been actively investing in on the ground projects. Since 2017, we've invested nearly $100 million in over 100 projects for flood preparation, flood damage mitigation, aquatic species restoration, even while we've continued to study and analyze more options like the potential Chehalis River Dam and the non-dam approaches to mitigating major and catastrophic flood damage. Last year alone, we and our partners restored nearly 270 acres of floodplain and had 20 aquatic species restoration projects approved for development design and construction. We've had 68 flood damage reduction projects completed or underway including flood storage, water supply resiliency, road projects, farm pads, bank stabilization, and more. And we assisted 16 individual property owners with personalized help to protect their homes from flood damage. So focusing on tonight's topic of land, at the urging of the governor, the board created the land process. Oops, Alex, it looks like you're Green chair has shifted. There we go. Uh, which stands for Local Actions Non Dam Alternative. And they've been tasked with developing and evaluating a comprehensive flood damage reduction plan for the basin that doesn't include a dam. So the steering group and their independent consultants were tasked by the board with recommending the best non dam alternative they possibly could. The board asked the steering group to consider what the science is telling us about projected increases in the frequency and intensity of future flooding events. They asked for an alternative that could provide a comparable level of protection as the proposed flood retention facility for homes, businesses, and critical facilities that are already in harm's way. And to that end, the board charged them to focus first in the part of the basin that would be most directly benefited by the proposed dam in order to allow for a better apples to apples comparison, but also to consider as a secondary focus, the rest of the basin as well. And the board asked the steering group 
to also evaluate and think about how the farming community and the agricultural sector will be affected by a non-dam approach, as well as how the needs of lower income and other historically marginalized people and communities could be taken into account. So leaving no stone unturned in the search for viable alternatives to the dam is an essential part of the board's due diligence, even in the face of criticism by some of enough studying already, which believe me, I know, I know many of you are thinking. Just as it's been an essential part of their due diligence to continue providing the flood control zone district the resources that it needs to develop the best dam proposal they can, one that does everything feasible to avoid, reduce, and mitigate the known harmful impacts a dam could have on the environment and fisheries and important cultural resources. So ultimately, of course, the decisions about what happens next are not just the board's decisions to make. They know that whatever long-term path they chart will be uh, something that requires the active support and the financial participation of the communities in the basin, as well as the state legislature and Congress, which is why your input is so important. And that's why we're really excited to hear, to hear about this topic tonight. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to Todd next, um, who is going to uh, give you a little bit of the perspective of the steering group members. And uh, Alex, I think your screen share needs to be temporarily disabled here while Todd <laughs> and Glenn. There we go. Perfect. Thanks, Todd. Hello. Thanks for having me. I uh, want to thank everybody for attending and taking time out of your evening to discuss this important topic of flooding and, and, and fisheries in the Shayless Basin. It's been a, uh, a very interesting uh, group of people that have come together in a collaborative effort to try to tackle this uh, uh, decades long problem. Uh, obviously, it's not easy and uh, otherwise it would have been done by now. So uh, it's it's been a great group to work with uh, with people with uh, from a, a variety of backgrounds and interests, and it's kind of neat to see, uh, especially after our last meeting, the collaborative effort uh, to focus on a, on a single solution to to provide uh, the maximum benefit to to our basin. Uh, with working closely with MIG, we hope to have uh, uh, the design settled and uh, and uh, our our strategy sent to the office of Shayless Basin. Uh, by uh, late or by early spring. And then uh, hopefully something can come out of that. Uh, I stress from the very beginning of this process that there's a, that the public is expecting a solution and it's time to stop kicking the can and, and, and make those hard decisions. And that's part of uh, the joy that I've witnessed with this collaborative effort. And uh, uh, not everybody's going to get everything they want, but uh, hopefully we can come up with something that will uh, uh, please most of us. So I've been uh, excited to be a part of this group and looking forward to uh, uh, see what comes out. And I want to thank the MIG team uh, uh, for the for the strong effort they put forward and um, anxious to see the final results. Thank you again for coming tonight. Glenn? Good evening, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, I'm Glenn Connolly, the Natural Resources Director for the Shales Tribe. And uh, the tribe has been... Um, you know, obviously downstream from the, the Twin Cities area, but you know, on the main stem of the Shales River, we've been experienced some flooding throughout the decades. And uh, the tribe has been a vocal proponent of finding different ways to uh, reduce flooding for folks and the flooding the impacts that come from it. And so we've been, um, you know, very happy to be a part of this process and bringing together a, a diverse group of people to talk about what kind of things can we do to reduce flooding while also protecting, um, you know, as best we can, the natural environment. Um, so we brought together, uh, you know, a group of, you know, we have some farmers represented, we have economic um, activity, you know, and also represented on the committee, uh, the environmental field, you know, interest, the industry is, is represented. And our goal was to also reach out to the community. So we've had public meetings and we've had uh, different ways to get feedback as to what kind of things will work and what kind of things won't be acceptable. Because we really want to make sure that what we're doing preserves the health of the communities involved. And not just, uh, I mean, the, the, the bonus here is that we're looking at all around the basin, the sub basins, the small creeks, the flooding that occurs all around. What are the ways we can help people in all those different areas and what values and things are important? Um, 
So it's been very important for us to get feedback from the communities. This is another opportunity for that. That's why we're having it to give you information on where we're at, some of the draft um, concepts of the plan that we've put together and get feedback as we continue to refine it and pick the best way um, to help reduce flooding without having some of the major impacts that come from huge engineering projects like uh, flood control dam or some other systems that might you know, make huge changes to the river or other things. So I'm happy to have all of you here to get us feedback. And I hope that uh, you'll gain some good information from the slideshow and the information we're gonna to present today. And we are open for comments and, and uh, you know, further questions and things as we go along. So thanks a lot for joining us. Thank you, you're up, Alex. All right. Uh, did we want to leave the survey up first before I go, or do you want to? How should we? Oh yes, thanks. Um, let's uh, let's go ahead and have you get started while that uh, survey is um, up for maybe another minute or so. Okay, great. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you, everybody. Once again, my name is Alex Dupi. I'm a principal with MIG and the project manager for our consultant team. And thank you so much for everybody to call in tonight. I know it's dinner time and everybody has uh, busy evenings. And so we do appreciate your time. So I'm going to step through a number of slides to talk about the process that we've been through, where we're going, and then um, some of the different options and interventions and programs that uh, we as the project team, the steering group, the board, and the broader community have been discussing over the past several months. So just to give you a sense of where we're, where we're looking, um, Andrea talked about you know, our general project area. Uh, we are looking primarily in the upper Chehalis River Basin, which is essentially Grand Mound and Centralia South um, to the, the um, beginning of the Chehalis River. Uh, and so we recognize that that is a core area of, of analysis, but also, you know, as a part of our process, um, looking at, for areas downstream as well as upstream for if we do any projects within the central and upper area, is there any impact downstream? Um, so we wanna make sure that we're not just thinking about those urbanized areas or those upper basin locations, but also focusing on those downstream areas where if we do a project and we have an impact that we need to address. And so just to give you some context, when we think about the Chehalis River Basin today, it is a very large area that encompasses a number of different environments. And when we think about flooding, um, it is significant. And so that blue area um, bounded by that red boundary is, our is essentially our project challenge. And so as a part of the draft environmental impact statement for the dam project, they looked at what was called a late century flood extent. So that's essentially the 100 year floodplain expanded about 25, 26% throughout the basin. So when you think about the scale of flooding and the scale of impact for this project, it's significant. And so I want you to think about that as we step through these um, different programs and projects that we've been discussing as a part of this process, as a way to be able to address a significant issue that faces, you know, that, that challenges um, everybody living and working within the basin. Um, so the question to us and the question that Andrea raised is, can we reduce catastrophic flood damage in the Chehalis Basin without building a dam? I know many of you are already familiar with the, the dam project and the analysis. Our charge is to do, can we do something that includes everything except for building the dam? And the other question is, haven't we already studied this? Why are we still doing this again? And one thing that we've come to is that there have been a number of studies in the past that have looked at different ideas and, and programs and projects, but we've come up with some new information and different combinations of projects that we believe have a valid opportunity and a way to reduce flood damage. And so when we think about that planning process, um, we had a series of steps that we worked through with the steering group. And really it's first is looking at the target level of protection. You know, what type of flood are we looking at? Where are we looking at? And what level of protection and damage reduction should we be, should we be uh, marching towards? What are the types of projects and programs that are needed to address flood damage within the basin without building a dam? 
how much can be achieved through floodplain restoration? What if we just did all of the great, continue to do all of the great work that the Aquatic Species Restoration Plan and the Basin Strategy are doing for floodplain restoration? How much can we actually incorporate into this process? And what does that mean for flood damage reduction um, for these large scale events? What are the economic development opportunities? Not only are floods you know, have potential huge impacts to the economy, but if you reduce that damage, what are some of the opportunities that that might bring? And then finally, and this is a piece that we are working on today, is what are different ways that we could actually fund and deliver these types of projects? Um, how do we actually get from planning to implementation and project delivery? So that's our project in a nutshell, and that's the direction that we're moving over the next several months, as Todd mentioned, uh, to have a recommendation later this year. Um, I want to step through some of the work that we've done um, early on with the community. Uh, we in May, um, through, through a large public process, had about 75 community members, um, elected officials, interested parties meet at the Great Wolf Lodge to start to talk about shared values and common interests. Um, so we talked a little bit about projects too, but really the goal was to be able to provide a sound basis for our project. You know, what are those key outcomes that we want to think about? You know, what are those things that tie us together um, as, a, as a community that will help draw and lead the specific process and projects that we would be developing over the coming months? And there were a number of, of elements and values that have continued to, you know, really drive the projects that we'll talk about in just a moment. Family, culture, and her heritage. Number one for many people within with who attended the meeting and took the follow up public survey that we had. I'm really respecting um, the strength that comes from the people, the heritages, the cultures within within the basin. Um, the natural wonder, valuing the Chehalis Basin's unique environment, employment and recreation op options as this beautiful place that many people call home. Um, economic vitality, you know, this is the center for, you know, Lewis County um, and, you know, the region for economic vitality and development. So keeping that basin alive and the businesses robust. Self-respect, so, excuse me, trust, respect, and self-determination. I'm um, really focusing on community-driven actions. We know that this is not something that somebody from outside can do and deliver. This is gonna take a community effort to be able to pull off and to be able to implement. Public safety and resiliency. Knowing that flooding is an issue, but how do you actually recover and be safe when a flood occurs? And then finally, healthy environment and healthy people. And really envisioning a solution that prioritizes the well-being of people and the environment. So it's not an either or, but really thinking about how people, the community, and the environment function together uh, to support uh, the goals um, to move this project forward. Um, we also had a follow-up meeting that looked at a number of the options that we'll show you tonight um, to get a, you know, additional input in the direction on how this project is moving. Um, and there were a number of things that came up that we're continuing to address today um, because this meeting was just in January. So we're still working through some of this, but really focusing on addressing not just that central basin issue of flood damage, but looking at both the upstream and downstream impacts resulting from those interventions. Quite a, a, um, tying in the aquatic species restoration plan more explicitly. That's a great project and program that has developed a number of restoration projects, really being able to bring that into this process. Demonstrating levy design and reliability. People are worried about, you know, if, if a levy fails, what does it look like? So being able to show that these levies and the design can actually work. Thinking about setback levies and allowing the rivers to flow as natural as possible to be able to provide that stable channel to not constrict the river as best we can. I'm addressing impacts to I-5. We know that I-5 floods, how do you actually reduce flooding to I-5 if possible? Maximizing a safe structures program, which I'll talk about in just a moment, um, but really being clear in what that means and what we mean by, by that, that program and a safe structures system. Be more specific about land use policies. Um, that is a key element of potentially, you know, what potentially what moves forward. How do you make not make the problem worse within the within the basin by development within the floodplain? And then providing more detailed cost estimates. I'll show a little bit on cost estimates. These are very high level, but people wanted to get us into get into more detail about what is included in those and how they were developed. 
So building the, the non-dam alternative, that's our foundation, our basis that I just showed. You know, what are the specific potential interventions that we could be using? And many of these are the Army Corps of Engineer definitions of what is considered structural, which are those larger interventions, um, engineered designs versus non-structural interventions, which could be programs or land use or smaller elements. Um, but dams, of course, you know, that's something that, um, you know, is, is well known um, as a structural element. Flood walls and levees greater than six feet, so those larger um, levees. Uh, river channel diversions, which we'll show some examples of, of that we're looking at. But also the non-structural interventions, um, things like flood proofing, elevating, and relocating homes and businesses in a voluntary basis. Those are things that are already happening in the basin. How can we start to bolster that? Um, looking at floodplain storage, you know, are there places that you could store flood water in event to slow or you know, reduce the effect of, of flooding in other areas? Berms and flood walls, which are essentially lower than six feet. They're not at the height of a levee, which is considered structural, but you know those smaller types of interventions to protect buildings and property. Um, local land use planning and building codes. You know, how do you keep people out of harm's way by not, you know, not developing within the floodplain where it floods on a regular basis? And then finally, resiliency programs, not just you know, the existing flood warning systems, but you know, be bolstering that as well as thinking about emergency preparedness plans and other types of things like prepositioning or evacuation routes. The county and, and the region are already doing some of this, but it's really looking at it at more of a, a larger scale. So we looked at a number of options. Um, both structural and non-structural. Uh, we looked at option one, which is really just that safe structures and floodplain management element. We looked at another option, which was water flow and diversion. So starting to get into those structural interventions, which actually creates new channels or expands the floodplain where there are pinch points. Uh, we looked at a levee option, uh, which looked at placing levees in strategic locations where there are a large number of structures uh, to protect them. And then we also looked at an option, which is essentially everything, moving all of these pieces forward in some fashion through a, a time frame that would incorporate all of these various elements. And so I want to stress that no decisions have been made about what the eventual recommendations will be. Uh, the land steering group will make a recommendation to the Chehalis board, as Todd mentioned, that's we're planning to do that in April to the board. Um, but ultimately, the Chehalis Basin Board will determine what the next steps are and how this, how this moves forward. So we are in the process of developing and refining what that recommendation might look like. Um, but really, it's the, the steering group and then the Basin Board that make the ultimate decision on what the next steps are. All right, so let's talk about the programs and, and interventions. And as I step through these, that slide I showed with those four different options, I'm gonna not talk about each option individually. I'm gonna talk about those various components. So if it says all interventions or specific types of elements, those are pieces of all of these, these, these um, options that we, we looked at. Um, but just in terms of time, I wanted to make sure we could get through of all of them. Um, so safe structures and floodplain management. So when we think about safe structures, that is a way to think about protecting, raising, or voluntary relocation throughout the basin where a structure or a business or a commercial um, type of, of development floods on a regular basis. So how do you start to you know, think about areas that may not be protected by a levee or a continuously flood um, for, through many different events that are there ways that you could protect, raise, or potentially relocate those structures? And the strategy is doing some of that. Um, th the safe structures program is one that would take it to the next level and really start to, to um, um, think about a more proactive approach. Um, floodplain management is something that we take very seriously, and that is something that the Aquatic Species Restoration Plan and other elements within the basin are already doing. So incorporating floodplain management and restoration to the greatest degree practicable uh, to really provide that benefit to lower level events. We know that that catastrophic flood essentially floods it floods the basin wall to wall. But for smaller events, being able to restore the floodplain to the greatest degree practicable really can help with those smaller, smaller level events. Some of the other elements that we're looking at, more the structural elements, when we talk about water flow diversion and, and improved conveyance, water flow diversion is actually creating a new channel. Um, we're envisioning one that's approximately 700 feet wide by about one mile long in the vicinity of the, the hospital. And I'll show some locations and, and visuals for what that looks like. 
Um, but this also requires relocating some existing infrastructure. So the Mellon Street Bridge, um, other elements that are within that location would also have to be relocated if we were to do the diversion and conveyance. So it's not just about, about flooding and about water, it's also about access and transportation and really access to the hospital in the event of an emergency to make sure that we have um, those facilities above water. Um, the other key piece for this element is looking at that constraint point at the existing Mellon Street Bridge where, where there's a pinch point, being able to widen the channel and the flood plan to allow water to move through more efficiently um, during a major flood. Um, but we do know, and this is, this is true with all of the infrastructure elements, that there are cultural resources within the vicinity, you know, within the river basin. And so as a part of any future action moving forward, um, all of these projects would have to go through an environmental review process that would include an evaluation for cultural resources, environment, as well as all the other um, typical elements you find within um, an environmental review. So finally, um, We've been talking a lot about potentially new and expanded levees or flood walls. Um, what those facilities are really depends on the location that you're at. Um, but what we're looking at potentially for this is approximately 20 miles of either new or expanded levees. And that would include potentially levees on the north bank of the Chehalis River near Fort Boris Park to protect both that recreation area as well as uh, residential structures on the, on the river. Um, potentially a new levee along the east side of I-5 from China Creek and Salter Creek. Um, potentially new and expanded levees along the north and south sides of the Skookumchuck River. Um, that area experiences a lot of flooding on a regular basis, so being able to address that. And then new and expanded levees around the Chehalis Centralia Airport. And that's a project that's been discussed under a number of other projects as well too, but being able to protect that, that specific facility. A new levee along the north bank of the Nowakam River near I-5 to protect um, um, development in the vicinity of that river. And then new levees along the north and south sides of China Creek from I-5 to the railroad tracks. So those are the major interventions. Um, and that's also some of the major programs that we're talking about. So I'm gonna dive into each one of those to show you a little bit more detail about what that means. So flood strafe structures really depends on the level of flooding that you experience. And so that could be additional flood insurance, all the way to a voluntary buyout um, with fair comp compensation relocation assistance. That's similar to the CFAR program that is, a, that is um, the, the basin already is implementing, uh, but taken to another degree, just given the amount of structures within harm's way. Um, in terms of interventions, those are those structural interventions. Most of them are situated, at least for now, within the Chehalis Centralia area. And the reason why is that is where the highest concentration of structures are located. So when we look about high cost intervention and infrastructure projects, it's really getting the most bang for your buck in terms of how many structures you can protect and the best ways to be able to do that. So the yellow lines are new or expanded levees. Um, the blue dotted line uh, kind of on the oxbow uh, along the river, that's the location of the potential diversion. And then those red areas right in the central portion of the map is actually where that expanded conveyance would be. Um, that doesn't mean we're not looking at other locations, um, but that where there are potential impacts related to these infrastructure projects. But really right now, the focus is on where are the greatest number of structures, how do we protect that, and then addressing any downstream impacts um, as, as needed. So what does that look like? When we come back to these maps, remember that blue line, or excuse me, that red line was at 2080 late century inundation level. When we start to see those, those levees come in, you start to see the, the, the flood extent be reduced. And so this is a shot um, looking just south near Chehalis. And then when you start to get into areas of Chehalis and Centralia, those levees do provide significant protection um, for developed areas. You'll also notice that many of those areas in light green are re potential restoration areas. So it's not just thinking about these infrastructure projects, it's also about how agriculture um, works, it's where potential areas for restoration, but also really thinking about this as a holistic approach, not just a single, a single shot to, um, to reduce uh, flood damage. Um, Many people ask us about the modeling. Have you done modeling to see if this works? Um, we're continuing to re, um, refine as we move forward. But what we're seeing is that 
with these options, if you were to do all of the options, um, it does have a significant beneficial effect within the Chehalis Centralia area. As you move downstream, to a certain extent, you do see higher levels of water um, to a point, but then at, at some point it does start to reduce back to um, the condition if you didn't do any interventions. Um, so when you see those red areas, because the levees confine or constrict the location of where the waters are, you ne naturally will see a little bit higher increase. And so what we're looking at is, are there areas we could mitigate? Are there areas that we need to look at a little bit more deeply to make sure we're not affecting others downstream to push our problem elsewhere? Um, but this is showing that between the levees and the diversion and the conveyance that we can provide a pretty significant benefit for um, structure um, damage reduction. So just to show kind of where we're at, if we look at the base level event, if we did nothing, those circles are the scale of, of impact. So the bigger the circle, the more structures you see that are affected. And the different colors within those circles, protect is green, which is essentially protect in place. You might need to move your, your furnace or protect your, found, your crawl space. Um, to raise, which is yellow, which is you're actually raising your found, your house, you're raising the foundation of your house to get above the floodwaters to potentially relocate those orange areas. And so really very few potential relocations compared to the scale and the size and the number of structures, but definitely in the Chehala Centralia areas where you're seeing those biggest bubbles and that higher concentration. When we start to look at all of the interventions, um, we believe based on the interventions that we proposed and then you know kind of how that relates to the flood retention facility there are different locations that are affected by what the land is looking at versus the the flood reduction facility um, but still about the same amount of protection um, we actually think from this from a number of structures removed from inundation that the land option if we were to do everything would have about the same or slightly better um, results for flood damage reduction to facility to, um, to structures than even the flood retention facility so keep that in mind and you see this difference in circles those much smaller circles compared to before um, you know it does become a significant benefit for those those areas with a high concentration of structures so I'll just show some pretty pictures. Um, this is you know, what floodplain restoration might look like. This is looking north near the hospital, um, the existing condition. You know, what if you were able to restore that and look at potential recreation and other, other um, wayfinding or placemaking opportunities, you know, really starting to tie that economic development to the floodplain while still allowing agriculture to occur in those places. Um, but we also know that it floods. So these need to be floodable locations that can be, you know, adaptable um, when it floods, but also provide those opportunities when it doesn't. When we start to talk about the diversion and conveyance, those bigger infrastructure projects, you can see just in the, up on the top of the picture, it says existing Mellon Street Bridge. That's the constriction point. So this option for the diversion and levees actually moves Mellon Street Bridge to the south. And so that's that bridge in the foreground. Um, you can start to see that diversion um, being constructed and some new bridges, uh, which would be required as a part of that. But when it floods, it does what it's supposed to do, which is allow actually water to move forward. And then you look at the other side of that, that's the inlet, this is the outlet. Um, you know, what if you started to create, you know, that diversion and how does that start to relate to, you know, areas to the south, still allowing that flood, that flood water to move forward, um, but protecting that with levee and uh, other systems to protect existing residential areas. And so what does that mean and what does that look like? Um, there's a lot of examples from diversion. This is Thornton Creek in Seattle. Um, this was a flood channel that uh, provides both um, natural amenity as well as flood, uh, flood management and stormwater. Um, the Napa River, which is a great example of a diversion, it's actually very similar in size to what we're talking about for Chehalis, um, which over time has provided a, a a development opportunity adjacent um, because there is flood protection. And just recently, you know, um, California experienced, you know, it's kind of major floods in January to where they did start to close the floodgates. And that same diversion was doing what it was supposed to do, which is move flood water through. Um, other locations are, that are doing this, um, it's not just in the United States. The Netherlands um, manages its river system in a number of different ways. An existing river that includes additional conveyance, um, again, a major infrastructure project, but a way to move water through more efficiently that also protects development. 
Cedar River and Cedar Rapids, Iowa. Um, Iowa. Similar setup um, using a series of flood walls and levees and other types of diversion to move water through. Um, but then also those more specific types of elements like levees and flood walls. Um, you know, a flood wall can be such just a wall or it can be also a part of the community that, that encourages economic development and protects adjacent residents. So, you know, a, a flood wall with walkway and residential areas. Levees can be landforms, so they don't have to be just a stone or rock or you know um, dirt mound. They can be designed to be you know aligned with uh, with the design of, of the community, um, but also providing amenities. Um, we've talked a lot with the community about adding amenities onto those levees. Um, and that's done in a variety of different ways, whether that's just a bike path or in some areas actually creating spaces that people can gather um, up just in the background of that image. That's a floodgate. When it closes, this area floods um, when they need it. But otherwise, it's a, it's a community gathering space and access to the river. They're also structural, you know, making sure that we have roads and bridges that are constructed to be able to work with the levee system, but also providing that protection. I'm a local a local example, uh, Mount Vernon, Washington, just north of y'all. Um, they flood on a regular basis and they're downtown flooded. And these are examples from uh, not this past January, but January 2021, where it was starting to flood. They designed this flood wall system that can be installed when it's flooding. Um, this is an example of, of what it looks like during the flood. Look at that little curve in the wall right there because when it's not flooding, it's open to, it's open to the community and you have that river access and that, that capability of spilling out from downtown onto the river elements. There's other, a number of other local examples. This is happening in um, Aberdeen right now with daylighting of Fry Creek. Um, again, Thornton Creek, an image of what that actually looks like at a broader scale um, with that adjacent housing and transportation. Um, but other places, you know, looking are looking at ways to really engage the river. Reno, Nevada, they've they've daylit their river through their downtown, which doesn't mean that Centralia can't do a similar thing with China Creek. China Creek floods on a regular basis, um, but it's also under underground in many locations. So what if you were to actually start thinking about daylighting, like removing those parking areas and using that space to create areas both that provide flood protection, but also provide that economic development opportunity, that community place uh, that many we've heard from many people talk about. Um, and under a, an, a rain system, you know, those areas begin become floodable. So the big question for many folks is how much does this cost? Um, it's not cheap. Um, they are expensive projects. Um, infrastructure for this could be, um, you know, up to 1.6 to 1.9 billion and safe structures could be expensive as well too, given the number of structures. So just in terms of scale, these are very high level, um, but what we're seeing is that these are a number of different projects that could actually build upon one another. So it's not a single project occurring right now. It could be a number of projects over time. So when you think about that cost, that could be 15 different projects as opposed to just one. All right, so just a couple more. Um, in terms of economic development opportunities, that's something many folks have talked about. Avoided flood damages. That's why we're doing this. Um, avoided local transportation disruptions. How do you reduce impact to move around? Infrastructure and construction benefits. Um, we're looking at that right now for what this actually means for the economy from this construction. Recreation, open space, and habitat. How do you build upon that as a local economic development opportunity? And then an opportunity to update land use and building codes. That it will be a critical piece of what we will continue to talk about with the steering group and the board. And then new economic development and receiving areas. So for our areas that could redevelop or develop from um, locations that would have to um, be relocated uh, from the floodplain, where do those go? What do they look like? Um, so thinking about those receiving areas as a part of the overall uh, process. All right, and then resiliency, just step through um, expanded warning systems. You're already doing much of that. That includes a number of different things that some are happening and some uh, will be recommending. Um, but then also thinking about farm evacuation. You know, how do you get livestock and, and people away uh, from flooding? And then expanding um, evacuation plans for people to move through. 
And then finally, thinking about resiliency, community training programs. How do you pre-position materials in the event of a flood? Um, thinking about animal refuges and livestock for pets. You know, people have to be able to, to move out for a short period of time until the flooding recedes and people can go back. How do you keep businesses moving? Potential recreation areas. And many more opportunity, uh, opportunities as a part of that re overall resilience plan. And then finally, potential funding sources. There's a number of different ways to do that. We are looking at different ways to fund this. Um, as with any major alternative, there will be need, need to be some type of local participation in project funding as a match. Um, what that looks like is still to be determined, but there's a number of different funds that you can move forward with. Um, and then in terms of next steps, maybe I'll actually stop there. We could talk about next steps in a bit. Is that, is that good, Andrea? Um, sure. Thanks, Alex. <clears throat> uh, we have had a number of questions come in. I know that was a whole lot of material to cover. And um, so people uh, probably have several questions beyond just what's been asked so far. But let me um, just start by mentioning that a few of the questions that were asked uh, have been answered live in the chat. So some of the written answers are there. But I'm seeing that we have several questions. Um, and I will start with um, uh, a, just a couple of clarifying questions um, that uh, were, were put in the chat. And a couple of these are sort of technical, but let's just confirm. Um, Alex, I want to confirm that question that somebody is asking is, are these results, the hydrologic results that are showing from a 2D model? Uh, that is correct. So they used um, our modeling. Our modeling team is using Riverflow 2D as a part of the a part of their modeling and so we've done uh, a number of runs for that and we'll continue to refine that over the next six to eight weeks or so but yes all of the current modeling is river flow 2d great and the other clarifying question just for those uh technical folks in the audience that are curious they wanted to know what is the return period of the draft eis design flood that's the basis for the modeling and uh, i think what uh for purposes of this evening's conversation, if you can just confirm, Alex, that the um, the information that your team is using is the same storm events and the same data that has been used in the draft environmental impact statement for the dam. That's correct. We are using the same um, assumptions for both the DEIS and the land. Right, so the late century 100 year storm event is what uh, Alex has been uh, sharing results uh, of the, of the modeling correct. for this evening. Yeah, okay. Thanks. So with that, let's go to some of the other questions. Somebody's got a question here about um, forest and agricultural practices uh, that could also play an important role in reducing flood severity. So um, curious to know whether um, these are being considered by the uh, technical team, the MIG team, as a part of the land work. Uh I can address agricultural practices, and, and Andrew, maybe you can help me with forest uh, to make sure I uh, state that correctly. In terms of agricultural practices, we are we have been charged by the board to look at agriculture um, as a part of land. What um, our potential strategies mean for agricultural um, 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 agricultural economy within within the basin. Um, in terms of agricultural practices, like how people use their land for agriculture. That is not something that we're looking at specifically, but we are looking at more of the economic impacts of, of on agricultural as a part of, of land itself. Thanks, and um, with respect to forest practices, um, there is um, definitely an interest in understanding more about what kinds of changes in forest practices could be, um, utilized in the basin to uh, have a you know to see changes in how water is is uh, managed through the through the basin um, we are in communication with forest manage management practitioners to look at those practices related to keeping uh, mature forest canopies um, as long as possible while harvesting and thinning to maintain uh, healthy forests so uh, it is not an explicit 
charge of the land steering group to look at that particular element, but it is something that the board um, is examining. Um, we have another we have another question here about um, information. What's what's known about information regarding the impacts on the aquatic env environment and species that are associated with these um, structural interventions that you've been talking about, such as levees? and things of that nature, have the impacts um, been assessed yet on those, uh, the, on the aquatic environment for, from these types of structural interventions? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. And where we're at right now is essentially developing what the vision for a program, a series of projects might be. Um, if these or one or you know all of these move forward, uh, we would refine what that alternative looks like and then Prior to any, you know, funding construction, it would go through a formal environmental review process, which would include aquatic species and other other um, environmental effects. So, we're not quite at that point yet. Um, but if any of these were to move forward, that would be, you know, a likely next step down the road. Thanks, Alex. Um, next question. Uh, I think uh, maybe I, I would. See if Dave can chime in on um, this is a question about um, the area of the proposed diversion. And the question is that at, at a previous meeting, it was stated that the city of Centralia has permitted a development recently, a uh, development project that's right in that same area as the proposed diversion channel. And if that's the case, um, is this diversion channel still being considered? Uh, great question. Um, the The development is uh, the parcel is partly in lowland and partly in upland, and they have put the housing on the upland portion of it. And the the diversion, the reason um, we have the route that we're showing is because this area floods. So what we're looking at is uh, can we utilize that portion of property that isn't developed and uh, have that part of the diversion and then also looking at moving it over towards Scrimmon Creek and um, is there room to move it over so we're looking at those two things in light of this new information thanks Dave and, and just to be clear that new development hasn't been built yet right I think the question is about what would happen if now that that development project that has been proposed has been approved does that change what you're looking at uh, yes, it's on paper and it is. Uh, it's yes, on paper, right? It's on paper <laughs> and ours is on paper. So between the two pieces of paper, we're <laughs> analyzing, moving it over. Uh, yeah, so it's still in consideration. Thanks. Um, I see that there was a, a clarifying question asked early on, and I, I apologize that I, I looked over it. I, I think it was probably answered. Um, there was a question about, can you define more specifically what you mean by levy and, and what they're made of, et cetera? Somebody was just asking for some more um, detailed definition. So uh, uh, I, I think you showed some really nice pictures, Alex, of the different forms that levees can take. They can be both engineered and structural, made out of concrete. They can be earthen berms that, that are um, reinforced, and they can take different shapes and, and certainly different sizes. Um, if, I, I hope that answers the question that the, that the um, uh, audience member had. If you had a more specific question, go ahead and uh, follow up with that. Um, and I am... Uh, trying to see where we're at here on our list of questions. Um, let's see. Ah, so somebody's got a, a process question. Once the land group submits their recommendations and assuming that the Shahale Space and Board accepts it, do you happen to know what the timeline is after that? At what point does the state decide whether to go with the land option or a dam or both? Um, I think I'll try to take that one on. Um, it's a little bit of an unknown, but um, so as Alex mentioned, the process steps that um, we do know are that the steering group is going to be presenting their recommendation to the board in April uh, of this year. 
Uh, at that point, the board has indicated that they are very interested in learning more about things like some of the questions that have been asked tonight, like what would the environmental impacts of some of these uh, elements of a land option include. So there would likely need to be some additional environmental review and some other work done to refine um, what the projects uh, entail that are part of the land alternative. And the board has also indicated that they want to wait and see what the final environmental review documents, the final environmental impact statements um, that are being prepared for the proposed dam, what those reports say before they make a decision about whether to move forward with, with the dam, with the non-dam alternative, with some combination of things. And um, so we're a little bit uh, out a ways from you know, making a decision about a dam or not a dam or some combination. Um, because we do understand that the final environmental impact statements for the proposed dam are not likely to be um, completed and published by the Department of Ecology or the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers until um, 2024 um, at the earliest uh, point in time is what we're, we're being told now. So that that question that you're asking about at what point does the state decide to move forward um, there'll be the board's uh, decision which in turn is really a, a funding recommendation to the legislature and to other funding partners and of course that includes the communities is the community uh, are the affected communities willing to um, participate in either of those uh, options or alternatives or some other combination. So um, there'll be some decisions made uh, by the board uh, in the next year or so, but not likely until 2024 at this point until we have the final EIS documents on the proposed dam. Um, I'm just doing a quick time check. It looks like we're at um, seven o'clock, a little bit after, and I want to do a quick scan. I see that there are some more questions um, coming that we haven't had a chance to um, answer yet. And so I think what I'm going to um, suggest, I see some folks trying to continue to put written answers into um, the chat feature. Uh, one of the questions, maybe our last question that we'll answer live here is about, uh, will the costs and benefits of the safe structures approach be compared to the costs and benefits of the infrastructure and levies? Um, there was a concern that the presentation was um, unbalanced and that it didn't provide very much detail on the safe structures program. Um, and there were lots of slides on the levies. So um, Dave, do you wanna uh, say a little bit about what you expect to see in the um, comparison about the uh, cost and benefits of the, those different approaches of the safe structures program relative to the levies and the other infrastructure? Yes, um, what we are, um, safe structures, are um, part of every scenario and moving that forward. That is a constant in moving forward, regardless of whether there's a dam and whether land does anything. It's safe structures is something that is is critical for this basin and critical moving forward. So that's um, that's a constant moving forward. It's a matter of how aggressive um, the funding and implementation of that is in the future with policy and, and funding. Um, as we're going through and we're looking at, we're taking the base storm from the DEIS and we're applying these solutions, we're applying the diversion, we're applying the levies. And what we're doing with that is we're looking at the change in structures that are inundated. And what we're looking for are the, um, the most benefit for the dollar spent um, and for other impacts such as construction impacts and uh, analyzing that. So as we're, if we're putting in a levy and, um, we are, there's, there's not a large habitat uh, degradation and that saves hundreds of structures that we don't need to relocate or raise. 
we are going to be in concept looking at the cost of that levy versus the cost of um, the development that's there, the infrastructure that's there, the water system, if if they're if they're on a water system, sewer system, the value of that infrastructure that's there. So yes. Thanks, Dave. And and I will just add that um, that is something um, that the Chehalis Basin Board it, uh, has asked the land steering group to do is to, to create some um, cost estimates and do some preliminary benefit and cost analysis. And the board intends to do um, additional work in that regard, um, not just comparing different elements of the land program, like what if you did mostly um, non-structural interventions and you ended up elevating more homes or relocating more homes voluntarily, as compared to doing the levies, that's one part kind of comparison that the land uh, technical team is working on right now. The board is also in, um, intending to do a comparison of some of those benefits and costs of the, um, the land alternative or the non-dam alternative and that suite of actions that moves forward uh, from the steering group and compare those to the benefits and the costs um, of the proposed dam facility. So, so there will be more, much more comparative analysis that will be um, generated that'll look at both costs as well as benefits. And, and by that, I mean both environmental costs as well as economic costs and, and social costs and benefits as well. So um, I realize that we're, uh, we're getting a little over time now. It's five, uh, five after seven and we've got... Um, Still more questions coming in. So this is great. This is really a, um, a part of what we really wanted to do was generate some, some interest and some, some questions from folks. Um, I know there's probably a lot more that people are interested in knowing. We've got up on the screen here a place where you can get more uh, information at the ChehalisBasinLand.com website. If you select the emerging options, um, menu choice from that website. You'll you'll get to see a lot more both written and visual uh, information about the presentation that that Alex um, just walked you through. Um, there is uh, also the ChehalisBasinStrategy.com website that has a lot more information about the Chehalis Basin Board, what its role is, um, what other parts of the strategy are, like the Aquatic Species Restoration Plan. And then that email address that's on the bottom of your screen there, info at ChehalisBasinStrategy.com, is a place you can send follow-up questions if you think of them after tonight or if you want to provide input and comments based on what you heard tonight that you want to make sure that the land steering group hears that the consulting team uh, hears and understands sort of what your perspectives and concerns are and um, the other really important place for you to provide some input is through a survey that is going to be launching tomorrow. And I'm gonna um, let Alex tell you about that before we close, because it is a really critical place for you to provide your input. And that is definitely what we're, we're um, happy to be engendering here this evening through your questions and your, your attention to these, uh, to these presentations. Alex, do you wanna tell us about the survey? Sure. Thank you, Andrea. So as Andrea mentioned, we will be launching a survey tomorrow um, that will be a map based survey. So it's an opportunity for you to provide um, direct input on on maps about, um, you know, kind of areas that you're you're familiar with and where you live and where you work, but also the some of the specific interventions and programs that we talked about tonight. Um, so it'll be very similar in terms of kind of the type of presentation that we provided for the information. Um, the goal for us is to to assist with that survey, the steering group, as they deliber deliberate and start thinking about what their recommendation might look like to the board in the coming months. And so it should take five to seven minutes. It's not a big ask or a big lift. Uh, I think it's excellent information for folks to be able to review, um, even just as background information. Uh, but also we really want your input um, because because that's what we're going to be using to help develop that recommendation with the steering group. So um, what we'll do is we have um, 
all of you signed up uh, for the web uh, the webinar tonight we'll we'll get that out to you tomorrow um, i encourage you to share it with friends and family and other contacts uh, we want to have as broad a base for input as possible um, and so i um, charge you with helping us get get the word out uh, so you, you obviously have an interest in this process. Uh, please help us make sure we get the word out on the survey so that we can get as much input as possible moving forward. Um, and it'll be open for about two and a half, two and a half weeks or so through the end of the month. So with that, I just want to thank you for the time tonight. And Andrea, do you want to close us out or um, move there? Or Glenn or Todd? Sure. I'm, yeah, I'm happy to. Um, I, again, I just uh, want to thank everybody for, for um, joining us tonight and and listening to the presentation asking some really great questions those questions that we haven't been able to answer live for you we have captured them and uh we do plan to provide a follow-up um to some of those questions uh and we will prepare a, a summary document of some of the q a that we've had here that will get posted on um the websites, both of those websites, the shahillspaceandland.com website and the shahillspaceandstrategy.com website. So either of those places, you'll be able to see the answers to um, some of the additional questions that were asked this evening. Um, Todd, Glenn, I'll give you the final word as our co-chairs that are guiding this, uh, this land process. Well, Todd, I'll go first, just say, I know that was real fast. There's a lot of information that's kind of pushed out to you folks, but there are definitely uh, places to go look at more information and get a better handle on it. So thank you all for coming and please do reach out to some of these uh, website links and do a little more reading and, and share more information and, and send us questions. Thanks for coming. Yeah, I want to thank everybody uh, uh, for attending tonight. Hopefully you uh, gleaned some information from it and, and, and came away a little more knowledgeable. Uh, it's been exciting uh, to see this move forward and anxious to see it to some sort of uh, completion. But uh, um, we're getting closer and uh, there is more information out there. This was quick tonight. Do some more research. Make sure you're looking at this with an open mind. I said at the very beginning of the process, if you can't imagine a world with the dam or without a dam, maybe you shouldn't be involved in the process. So uh, let's find a solution and, and uh, everybody have a good evening. Thank you, everybody. Good night. Thanks, all.